What's up guys and gals, and welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we're going to be checking out Lords and Villains. We checked this game out in a very early alpha prototype, like some years ago. I don't remember how long it was, but it's coming out soon. In fact, by the time this video goes live, it, va it may very well be available for your purchase. And so anyways, Lords and Villains. There's a lot of games out there that are trying to be RimWorld, or at least are heavily sourced from RimWorld. This game is not one of them. This is a weird colony management game in the sense that like a lot of it is hands off and a lot of it is really just you adjusting meters trying to get everything just right. But ultimately in this game you are the lord over a fief and you give land to various peasants and then very, very hands-off style, they kind of just do stuff with that land. And then you're kind of responsible for, like, the policies and the market prices and sort of the taxation of everything that's going around. And you have to actually sort of economically balance your colony. Because, like, if you charge too much for taxes or for other things, these guys actually have their own possessions. And they have their own money. And they have their own finances. And you can actually, like, bankrupt people. And then they'll just, like, starve. And also, don't feel too badly about treating your... Your, your peasants poorly in this game they are terrible people I was playing last night and my farmer just let his neighbor starve because his neighbor didn't have enough money for food he was like yeah I guess you die now uh, so like don't feel too bad about oppressing people in this game because this is truly a game about like really really bad villagers uh, let's go ahead and start a new game here we'll play on the fields and then we've got to come up with a name for our character we'll be a dude over here uh, we'll be a little bit younger that's fine that sounds good. You can actually customize your personal character right here. You can change the capes and stuff like that around if you want to. Uh, you can decide if you start the game with a partner. If you start without a wife or a husband, uh, the game is more difficult. And so anyways, that's one thing to keep in mind is that I'll sort of explain why as we dive on into this. Uh, we will be Lord Bacon Slurry. There we go. Lord Bacon Slurry. Confirm, and off we go to generate a map. All right, Lord Bacon Slurry, I have bestowed upon you the right to rule over this land. I expect you to take great care in exploiting this land and the richness that it has to offer. Should you not succeed, I will find someone else to take your place and your head. Not everyone gets the same opportunity as you, so keep that in mind. By confirming, you shall certify your oath of fealty Best of luck on your journey. So here we are. Now these are all my little villagers right here. We've actually got a couple of families. As far as I know, you always start out with a farming family, and you always start out with a foresting family. And then from there, everybody that comes in is just going to be random as the game unfolds. And so anyways, really what the first thing you need to do is, you need to take a look and you need to figure out the economic policies. And you can do that through this little like menu down here. Basically, you need to think of things in two categories in this game for it to really, really work. You have things that belong to your family, Lord Slurry, and you have things that belong to your villagers. And those two things meet at a median point, uh, effectively called serfdom. Um, and so, like, you've got to decide whether these people are going to be your stewards. You've got to decide whether or not these people are going to be your serfs. And that's kind of going to change their rights and your rights based on the time period. And it's going to take a little bit of like a learning curve. It took me three or four colonies to really sort of grasp what it was I was doing and like what would nosedive my colony into the ground versus what made everything kind of function on its own. And so anyways, the first thing that I like to do is this warehouse book right here is probably the most important button in the game. Uh, we need to give food to everybody because they don't have any food. So we have the Peeve family and we have the Tibbin family. All right, so we will give the Peeves 50 meals and then we will give the Tibbins 50 meals. That should hold us for a couple of days. And then we also need to create a menu right here where we sell stuff to the peasants because, like, we can chart things out and we can say, hey, go build a building. But if they don't have the materials to do it, they won't build the building. And so you've got like a couple of options at the beginning of the game for how you want to do this. I like to just add everything. And so planks, wood, uh, we need to have stones up here. And then what I like to do is I like to modify the prices on these because these are really, really expensive. Uh, if you set them to like the fair market value, 
it's going to get a little bit wild and crazy out here. Uh, so what I would personally do is I would set this up for each one to be like one gold coin. And then I'd probably do the same thing right here because most of your villagers start out with like 200, 300 gold coins. And, and like the price of 375 is really, really high and it's going to bottle them. It's going to bottom them out really fast. And so what you'll have is you'll have kind of like people in your colony that economically they lag behind other people. Uh, the big problem that I run into in the early game is that my foresters end up being absolute ballers uh, because if you don't sell them this stuff, they will buy it from other villagers. And the one thing that every villager in this game has in common is that they all need stuff from the forester, whether it be firewood or building materials or whatever else. And so foresters in this game have like this weird habit of just becoming ridiculously wealthy. If, if you don't set your colony up correctly, everybody else ends up broke and the forester ends up just like rich as hell. Uh, so anyways, we need to build some houses out here and we need to designate some land. I would start off with some smaller plots, uh, so we can designate a household pretty much wherever we desire to do so. Uh, the efficiencies of how well people do are going to be based on the proximity to their work zones. So, I'll probably put in like a little, let's say, that's 5 right there, that's a 7. Let's put in a little 7x7 seven seven right here. That's a 7x8, there we go. That looks good to me. And then this will have a little 5x5 five five room attached to it. So there we go. And then this is going to be our forester's area. Where he lives and where he grows his family and where he has his kids and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the other person that we're going to need is a farmer. So I'm just going to draw up another 7x7 seven seven over here. So that's a 7x8, seven 7x7. Seven seven. Okay. And I'll probably actually do the exact same thing, give that like a little lump on the side of it right there. And then the way that we designate this is you click on the zone and then you go to this little tab right here and it's going to open up the paperwork. And so I wanted to give this right here to the two family members of Adam Tibbon. And you have a couple of options. You can go with Frankel Moi. I don't know what that word means. I know what it does. That effectively means that he's a freeman. Uh, and so this basically designates him as not a serf. Uh, you aren't really going to use this option. You kind of want them to be serfs. Uh, the other one is that it is a fee farm. That means that you own this property right here. You are effectively the landlord, and he will pay you money every day that he lives inside of there. It comes down to 1.5 gold per season for him to live on that property. You can't adjust this value right here. It's set to 10 by default. You can raise it up, actually, like 2 gold in this game. We start with 700, like 2 gold in this game is basically nothing. Uh, but keeping it cheap means that if they're not paying you a ton of money for rent, they actually have more money to spend on other things, which will make the commerce and the trade sort of more vibrant in your territory. And so I'm going to set him up as a fee farmer. He is officially a serf now. He lives on my property. He works for me. And then this house over here, we are going to set this up as a fee farm for the P family. They have eight people, do they? Seriously. That is the largest starting family that I have ever seen. Eight people in the P family. Okay, so we're going to have to expand this out a little bit more. They're going to need a little bit more space. That's just undeniable. Hopefully that's enough space. I'll add one more chunk right here just in case it's not. But the P family is kind of living in a compound right now. Okay, so we've got that set up. Now they need work zones to work inside of. And so for the P family, they're going to need to grow a lot of food. Uh, because they are a big family. The Tibbin family is not that large. But what we need... Oop, I messed up. There we go. We'll make a big old farming area right there. And then, what I would also suggest is that while editing this zone, we should add sort of a barn over here. They may go broke before they get this done. Is that counting as like a separate area? Okay, we'll give them like a separate barn over on this side. Hopefully the other families don't get jealous. But here's the second menu you need to know about. Basically there's living areas in which you collect rents or you designate somebody as a free man. And then there's work areas. And the work areas have a couple different options. So you have sockage. I don't really know how to say that word. Uh, what that means is that if you look at this little meter over here, these are the seasons. Uh, your taxes are paid seasonally. So everything that is owed to you as a lord of the land is paid to you seasonally. Uh, you get it at the end of the season, beginning of the season. And so if you run out of material somewhere like in the middle, it's going to be a little bit of a wait till everybody pays their due. 
Uh, but what this does is this allows you to just straight tax their, their production. So this is an agreement that they get to work this area in exchange for X amount of the product because it's your land, but you are effectively renting it out to them for a cut of the profits. Uh, there's fee farming. That's the same as what they live right there where they just pay you money and they get use of this. There's stewardship. Stewardship is where you pay them to work on the land. This is effectively them being an employee. Uh, you pay them like an employee, but you get every single thing that is produced. But it's at the end of the season. So if they if they aren't hauling stuff and you're like, man, they've got so much food and whatnot laying around. Why aren't they bringing it to the center of town? They don't bring it till the end of the year or until the end of the season. And so anyway, stewardry actually works really, really well. Or you can designate somebody a freeman, and they can just do whatever they want with this land. They pay no taxes. They give you no cut. Uh, for right now, what I would suggest is that for the farmer, we will set up just normal taxation. So we agree that the P family can make use of this farm field right here in exchange for 17% of everything that is produced off of that land. There you go. The agreement is signed. Uh, the next thing that we need to do is we need to set up a workplace for the Tibbon family. The Tibbon family are foresters, or foragers anyways, and so we need to find the royal forest tile right here. And then we'll just set up an area where they are allowed to basically gather anything that's in the land. And then over here, what I like to do personally, so you have with foresters, it's kind of an interesting thing, because the foresters tend to ruin your economy by accumulating more money than the Lord has, uh, because everybody needs the stuff that comes out of the forest. So if you go with sockage, or sausage, or however you say that word, what ends up happening is they will hoard all the wood, Everybody needs wood, and they'll make an absurd amount of money. They'll drain everybody dry. So what I have been doing lately is I've been granting them stewardry, uh, which effectively means that I pay them money, and I get everything. That way, everybody has to come to my family for building materials. Uh, this game is sort of an experiment as to like what happens when a nobleman decides to micromanage th their economy to a greater or lower extent. Uh, and so... What I'd probably do here is we will do sausage. I mean, normally I do stewardry, but for the interest of shaking things up, I'm going to do this this way. We're going to say that we get 30% of everything produced on his <laughs> land because that's my forest right there. I'm just letting him dwell on it. Uh, we can cancel his ownership at any time if we desire to do so. And now we need to build our buildings. Now, we are not responsible for building any of this stuff. Uh, we will designate what needs to be built and where it needs to be built at. However, the sort of interesting thing about this game is that your peasants are responsible for themselves. Uh, so once we set this up, they are going to work this land. They are going to live on this land. They're going to build on this land. None of it has anything to do with me other than supplying them with some materials. And so anyways, for the P family, it should be very, very simple to get this all set up. This is a barn, so we'll leave a wall off it right there just to save materials. Other things that we can do is we've got oak wood floors out here. We'll go ahead and throw those in just to beautify a little bit. There we go. Looks good. And then over here, can I do like a thatchy floor? We've got stone paving. That might work out okay. Yeah, let's do some stone paving over here. Just to sort of designate that as a barn so that I can eyeball it easily. They're also going to need a door. Doors serve an important function in this game. If people fall on hard times, they become like criminals and they'll steal from each other and they'll sneak into each other's houses and like jack each other's stuff. And, and so anyways, you kind of want to avoid that. So like put in doors. Uh, putting in doors and storage containers like chests that your colonists can use to like lock up their stuff is a good idea just in the off chance that somebody decides to go rogue and pillage their way through the countryside. All right, so their house is done. Uh, we need to get the Tibbon family set up over here. That should be easy enough. They only have two people, so they don't really need a whole lot of amenities like the other family does. There we go. We'll throw in a wooden door right there, and this will just be like a little side area. And what you will see is that they will not build a damn thing. That's because all of the stuff belongs to me. Every single one of these materials, just like the land they live on, all of the material belongs to me. And I need a way to disseminate that material. Like, you need a way to hand it out. And so the next thing that we need to do is we need to open up our zone visibility menu. And if we put in a storefront over here, this is a storefront that belongs to me. 
And if you notice, my family will spring into action here and build that right there. And there you go. My wife is going over to build that storefront right there. Uh, they are going to knock all this down, it looks like, so that's good. They've got 50 meals right there just kind of laying on the ground. Let's speed up the process a bit. And now, you remember how we set up our warehouse log earlier for stuff that we were willing to sell? Well, now my wife will hang out over here all day long and just sell things to people that they need for building their homes. And in fact, you'll see right there... She came over, paid money, then she went to the stockpile and grabbed all the stuff that she needed uh, for building her home. And her husband will come over here and grab stuff too. And so it looks like we are making like a little bit of money right now. But we haven't stored it up inside of chests or anything else, so I'm pretty sure it doesn't get added to our final tally until that happens. Yeah, this family's gonna, with eight builders, this family's gonna whip up, like whip together their property really, really quickly. Yeah, we made about 200 bucks today. The foresters are over here. They're working a little bit slower just because, like, there's only two of them. Uh, families don't help each other out with the raising of property. They purely worry about their own property. Uh, so, like, there's not... So there is, like, cooperation in this game, but, like, it's sort of limited to certain systems that are expressed inside of the game. Like, largely the families function independently of one another and only really interact with each other when they need something. So if we go to, like, our... We can go to our warehouse menu right here. We can actually select a family. You can click this button that says what they need. Uh, it'll tell you. Uh, so the P family wants milk. They want stone. They want drawstring boots. They want planks. They want wood. And they want cooking ingredients. You see what I mean? And you could do that with every single family. And eventually we will set up a marketplace and... Us as Lord, it's only really like micromanagey at the beginning of the game. Once you've got everything set up, your society just kind of functions on its own. If somebody needs food, they go buy it from the farmer. If somebody needs wood, they go buy it from the forester. If somebody needs new clothes, they go buy it from the tailor. But at the beginning of the game, you kind of got to help them along a little bit. Otherwise, things tend to go kind of sideways. Were they just like not building a wall right there? I feel like they were definitely supposed to build a wall right there and then just nobody ever did. Ah, and we've run into a problem. We did not start out with enough wood. So, this is going to necessitate that we set up a market a little bit earlier than I wanted to. Uh, so what we're going to do here is we'll set up a market on this side right here. And this little market area belongs to us. We tax everything that happens in here. You can designate another family to be responsible for it, I think. No, never mind. It's locked purely to the Lord. Uh, but what this will give us access to is we can build storefronts over here. And so I would suggest we put in a couple of storefronts. And these storefronts are free. Anybody can use them in our village to sell things to other people that they might need in order to get stuff up and going. The other thing we need is farm fields. So I'm going to put in farm soil right here. And we are going to have to micromanage this a little tiny bit in order to get it up and running. But don't worry about it for right now. Uh, but yeah, people ran out of materials, unfortunately. So we got to wait for our foresters to start selling wood to other people so that they can actually get stuff done. Uh, the other thing that I would suggest doing is that we maybe have a chest or two inside each home. That way, people have places to store their stuff. It also has an added benefit. They put their money inside chests. That way I can check and I can see how economically feasible each family is. Basically, this is my way of looking at their tax records and figuring out if they have enough money to survive. Uh, because you can, like we granted food to everybody at the beginning of the game, you can grant like free stipends and whatnot to people in order to kind of give them the old government bailout. All right, so with our fields over here, uh, we actually need to set this up. These don't work all by their lonesome. I wish that they did. Uh, it's a little micro-y. I kind of wish that the farms just sort of did their own thing and they had presets for each season. Uh, but we actually have to do this manually. So you got to go to adjust priorities. And it's not products that you want to set this up in. It's soil. Uh, so for right now, we can't grow wheat. We can't grow oats. But wheat is the thing that's queued up for this season. What I would suggest is that we grow parsnips, carrots, potatoes, and maybe a little bit of barley. Maybe some rice in there, too. And then we'll finalize that. And then what you'll see is that the pea family, they will start planting crops. And they're just going to do this randomly. I do wish that they segmented it out. So if there was an algorithm inside the game that looked at the division. So we've got 20% of each thing if it actually calculated the squares from top to bottom or left to right. So that, like, the crops were actually organized in the field. I think my OCD would like that a little bit better. But, like, eh, it's not that big of a deal. How much money does this family have? So they have... 
They have 500 gold coins, so they're actually doing pretty well. These guys have 112 gold coins, so they're kind of like on the edge. But it'll get better. They're chopping down trees for right now. They need a wood storage out here too. Uh, so we want to give them some ground storage. And really, the ground storage, we should probably put it inside so that people don't steal out of it. We'll put that right there. We still have planks left for sale, so anything that requires planks we can put in. I'm pretty sure beds require wood, so unfortunately we're not going to be able to do that. We can do straw beds, but those aren't quite as nice. But I don't think we're going to have an option, so we'll put in a straw bed right there and a straw bed right there. These guys need eight beds, which is just like a lot of beds. So we'll put in a straw bed there, straw bed there, straw bed there. That's three. And then over here, we've got four, five, six, seven, and then eight. Eight beds. Their family finally has enough beds for everybody to sleep in. Having beds makes them revitalize themselves a little bit faster and get back on the horse a little bit quicker so we get a little bit more productivity out of them. We also need barrels. Uh, so barrels are going to be for storing fish, fruit, and vegetables, which coincidentally is what they're growing right now. And so we'll put in like three barrels for storage over here. We'll expand the size of this field if need be as time goes along. But for now, I think we should be set up. They're kind of in their free time right now, so they're just going to kind of sleep amongst the grains. All right, and so the system is functioning now. Uh, the forester has begun selling logs and whatnot to other villagers, so they were able to finish their house. Uh, there's no roof on any of these houses, though. That's the other part that we kind of need to be aware of. In addition, these guys are going to need a way to process the barley so that we can get more straw and whatnot uh, for making thatching and roofs. And so we need to go to production, and they need a flailing spot on their property. Apparently, we can't put the flailing spot right there. Okay, uh, put the flailing spot maybe over here. Yeah, that's fine. Flailing spot, flailing spot. Perfect. And the other thing that we're going to need is we actually need to start kind of like setting up their homes so that they can provide for themselves. Uh, so every household needs a cooking table. Uh, every single household is going to need a cauldron. Every single household is going to need a well, which is around here somewhere. There it is. Uh, we'll kind of just put a public well right there. I don't think I need to designate ownership of the well, but every family is going to kind of need a well uh, so that they can draw water. And then we need a... They, they make their own meals, and so we don't really have anything to do with that past a certain point. We can put that in right there, and then we can also... They needed a... They already got their well. Oh, the cauldron is what they needed. That's what they needed. So we'll put in a cauldron right there. Uh, everybody likes to have a place to sit and to rest as well. Uh, so we'll have them have like a... I guess we can put... They only have two people in their family, so they're not actually going to need that much. Uh, we can put those right there just for something humble for them to eat at. Whereas these guys over here are actually going to need... A pretty good spread, in all honesty, of places to sit and places to eat. Otherwise, they're just not all going to fit. I'm actually kind of adapting to an unknown circumstance right now. I've never had a family as large as the Peeve family, ever. Usually, it's somewhere in between two people and five people. Uh, eight is a lot of people. And so, as you can see, they're going to go ahead and build all this stuff. Um, they give you tooltips. This game does a really good job of teaching you how to play. You're just going to have to do, like, a lot of reading. There is a formalized tutorial inside the context of the game. It was a little slow for me, so I learned to play the game just by diving straight on in and reading the tooltips as they popped up on the side. Uh, we've got a new family that wants to join us, the Derville family. Uh, they've got three people in their family, so father wife and kid we already have a family of foragers so i'm going to say no to that i i really don't want to have any like rivalries going on if we have people like montagues and capulets fighting in the street over the rights to sell logs i don't think that that's going to be conducive to a healthy society that just feels like to me something that's going to fall apart very very rapidly but now that they have all their cooking stations we should be solid on them making their own meals I should think, at least once the harvest comes in. Have they actually brought in a harvest yet? No. Uh, farms are pretty farms are pretty fast in this game, so eventually they should pull all these crops right here, and they should start selling food to the entire village. Uh, I would actually maybe think that we should expand the size of this zone right here and make it a little bit larger, uh, just to make sure that we have more than enough food coming in. 
And especially because their family is so large, they have the manpower to actually work a field this big. Normally, my farmer at the beginning of the game only has like three people in it, and so you've got a little bit of like a work bottleneck. But since there's eight people in their family, kind of quiverful style, I think they can handle it. Like, I think they'll be okay. And honestly, feeding all these people through the winter is going to be really, really difficult. And so I'll keep an eye on how much food they're storing as we go in towards, like, the end of the season. And if they've got enough food stored, I'll leave it how it is. But if not, we'll expand the fields out this way and this way as well. There are other things that we can do over here. So they've got 20 wood stocked up. There are some logs and things laying around. They haven't paid their dues to me yet. Um, maybe I should have taken that other family of foragers. I should have. I think I should have taken the other family. We need two people to work this forest right here. Otherwise, I don't think we're going to have enough wood. I'm thinking about the taxes that are going to come in. We've got some masons that would like to join us. Okay. Do I have any stones or anything anywhere nearby? I do over here. Okay. Stone masonry sounds good. Yeah, they can join us. Welcome to the, uh, welcome to the squad. We'll go ahead and grant their family some meals. The Kugi family. We'll give them 100 meals. And with the Kugi family, I would like for them to kind of live somewhere near the rock over here. So we'll go ahead and designate a household on this side. How many of them were there? Three? Three. Okay, there's three of them. So they don't really need, like, a big estate. They could probably make do with just, like, a little 7x7 seven seven with the same kind of little adapter on the side that we have with the other families. There we go. And then we will grant this to the Kugi family. There we go. The Kugis are up. Perfect. They're all Kuganated. And we need to designate a work area for them. That's going to be the other part. And so we've got a we've got a masonry area that they're going to need to work inside of. So we'll go ahead and take this right here, and we'll just make like a little 5x5. Five five. They'll probably share this plot with a minor family that'll go right here, and they'll work this, and they'll bring the stone directly to the Kugi family so that they can work on stuff. We'll go ahead and grant this to the Kugis right now in exchange for, let's say, 25% of everything produced on the land, and then we got to build their house. Unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of logs to go around. Uh, this family owes me a tithe, so they should be setting aside things. As time goes along, they may actually need more material storage as well. Maybe possible. Let's go with another ground storage or two. There we go. We'll put in two more ground storages. Their house will just be a little bit cluttered. Uh, the other thing that we actually don't have access to right now, too, is firewood. I think firewood is required for cooking, and so we need to make a sawhorse. That's a good place to start so that we can make planks. Actually, I don't want to make the sawhorse yet because they might turn all of the wood they owe me into planks, and then that'll be a little bit subpar. But what we do need is... Oh, is that not inside of there? Okay. It must be inside production buildings then. It is indeed the wooden block. Uh, the wooden block is very, very important in this game. It allows you to chop firewood effectively, and then they can sell the firewood to everybody else in the village for cooking their nightly meals and whatnot. But this family over here, uh, we haven't put roofs on anything yet. This game's roofing system, I'm glad to report, works perfectly fine. Uh, there are no problems with it. You guys know that I always look for issues with roofing systems when I play games like this. And the roofing system functions fantastically. Uh, we'll put this in right here, and then we'll kind of get you right there. Get you right there. I suppose I could set up an overhang over here, but, like, don't feel like it. All right, and so they should come buy a whole bunch of straw from me, since I think that I'm probably the only person in town who has straw for right now. The farmers will have straw later, because when we process the barley, uh, they're going to have to beat the barley on the flailing spot, and that will produce barley and straw. But for right now, we're kind of not at that point in the game yet. Uh, but people like to have roofs. I totally forgot about that. I like having a roof. Having a roof is great. I don't know, living out in the rain and whatnot just seems like it would kind of suck. So what is everybody up to right now? What are let me let's get a let's get a feel for what all of our villagers are doing. So the peeves. The peeves are looking to buy food. They're looking to buy clothing. Okay, so we should probably pick up a tailor at some point. The Tibbins are looking to sell wood, and then they are also looking to buy wood rods. They should have wood rods, though. Uh, the Kugi family. They are looking to buy just about anything, in all honesty. 
We haven't really set their family up for success just yet. I really wish I took that other Forester family. I wasn't thinking clearly about that. There we go. They've got some more deposit spots, and they've already got the supply of wood rods. That's specifically why I told them to build their roof with wood rods, is because they already have them in their possession because they haven't paid their taxes yet. So, roofs are going up. People are looking to sell logs. We should probably build a house over here for these people. It's going to be one of those long-term projects because we're not pulling as much wood out of the forest as I would like. But for now, it's a start. We'll try to give them a place to live at. They should get a couple of logs from chopping down these trees, in all honesty. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll put in some floors over here. Because they're masons, I would love to have them have like a stone floor. But since we have to have them set up and working first before that'll work, uh, I could put a wooden block over here, though, so that they can start doing masonry stuff. They'll buy the stone from me directly. Uh, but we are going to want to pick up a miner pretty soon. Someone to supply their supply chain with the things they need. I haven't built my manor. Uh, my family lives in the Lord's Manor, but we don't have any building materials right now. So the Lord's Manor is kind of on hold until everybody pays their taxes for the first time. And that's sort of why I prefer to have my foresters on stewardship. Uh, so that I get everything and then I can dole that out to people as necessary. A family of butchers. Okay, I don't think we need butchers right now. We actually don't have any husbandry or anything else going on for the moment, so I don't think it's going to be necessary. They've built one wall over here with the tree that they chopped down. It does look like they're working stone, though, on their own property, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. We may actually be able to do something here. I'm going to have them put in stone floors. Uh, we'll go with stone block floors, I think. Oh, you need tiles for that. Okay. We'll just have them do stone block floors. We'll see what that looks like. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Looks okay. I mean, it's not the best masonry work that I've ever seen, but, like, it's something. So, yeah, this is kind of a weird city builder. Like, this is a very, very weird colony management game, but I think it's a good colony management game. Uh, that being bore in mind, I think it's an interesting colony management game uh, for the simple reason that um, it tries... This is one of the few games I've ever seen that's not trying to be banished. And it's not trying to be RimWorld. It's trying to be something much more specific, which is really kind of a fiefdom management simulator uh, where, like, you provide the necessities for your people, and then from there, society just kind of runs itself. If one family needs something, they buy it from the family next door. Or if they can't get it there, they'll buy it from you, and then they make their own money, and they make their own food, and they do their own things. And really, you're just here planning where all the buildings go and what all the prices are at in the market. And you've got to kind of, like, balance that on out. I do think that the graphical overhaul that they gave the game since the last time we checked it out is absolutely fantastic. I absolutely love the tile set that they're using. It's very saturated. It's very pretty. It's very nice to look at. Um, there's tons of like objects here that you can place all over the place. There's tons of supply chains and whatnot that you're going to have to learn. Like every family needs like this. They need that. They need like stuff in order to get things done. And so anyways, it's kind of like a, it's a very, very interesting game. And, it, and it's one that's kind of grabbed my attention, I guess, with how, like, just weird and unique it is. So anyways, Lords and Valanes, my name is Splattercat. I sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so you don't have to. Today up on the chopping block, as I said, Lords and Valanes, tomorrow we'll likely have something else. Thank you for hanging out with me, and I'll see you all tomorrow uh, once we get back to it. Bye, everybody.